Oliver Fade takes it there, contains strong language, intense violence, and is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, and welcome. This is Oliver Fade, and I'm bringing you the podcast that speaks the truth about the streets. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Oliver Takes It There. And uh, today we have Angelia Bianca with us. Hi, Bianca. Hi. Hi, Oliver. Yes, and everyone calls me Bianca. Bianca. Thank you for having me here. Thanks for being here. I know you have an incredible story, and I wanted to share that with the audience. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and... What, um, what your book almost talks about. Well, my book is brutally honest. And for a person that doesn't know me, uh, I'm not a likable character during that mayhem. So I had 36 years. I started doing morphine pills at nine years old. Um, I don't blame it on anybody or my family. I was just one of them kids, real wild. And... Uh, I went on to continue getting high, and um, by 13, I was taking acid and pills and this, like, all types of stuff. You know, what they call now ecstasy, we called back in the day MDA. So I was like really, really reckless kid. Back in, I'm going to be 65, so we're talking a long time ago. You could be 14 and get into any club, especially if you were cute. You know, nobody cared about IDs and just how it was. So I was already going to clubs and. At 14? 14, concerts. At 13, I started. Um, yeah, so I was just like, I knew everything. No one could tell me anything. And I didn't want to hear anything. That's the kind of kid I was, unfortunately, for my family. Yeah, that's the, the teenager mind. Yeah, but it can, can, went on to my adult age, adulthood as well. So um, by 17, I tried heroin, and you, there's a whole story about how I first tried it in my book. Um, but basically, I went with my high school best friend to Arizona to visit her sister, who I, we didn't know, but she was a heroin addict. She's like seven years older than us. And... Um, I was so curious as to, you know, while we were staying with her, why does she go out in the morning and then go right in the bathroom and doesn't come out for hours, you know? And then finally mm. I figured it out, and I, I asked her, you know, I, I, MJ, I want, to, I want to try it. And she was like, she didn't want her sister to know. So I was like, I won't say nothing. She was like, no, no. She was like, I will not do that to you. This is a horrible life, horrible and you'll like it because you already like barbiturates and downers and different things, and you will like it, and you will someday end up a hooker on Cicero Avenue. And how she said this to you. She said that to me back then, and how crazy that that actually happened 25 years later. You know, it's 30 years later. But anyway, so um, she would never let me, but. And, and begged me not to. She was very against it. And um, then one day, because my f- grandma was sent, wiring me $40 every day in, in Tucson, Arizona, oh, okay. to make sure I was okay. I was yeah, like a yeah. highly spoiled kid. And my gra- I was the She's favorite. taking care of you. Yeah, I was like the favorite of my grandma. I, I, That's cool. I was like, you know. But anyway, um, so one morning, MJ was dope sick, really sick, and she didn't have any money. And so she said to me, uh, it, can, can you lend me $10? You know, because she knew I got that 40 every day. And I said, for what? She was like, I need some dope. I'm so sick. I'll pay you back. And I said, yeah, no, no, because I had her, you know? And I said... Oh, it's time to negotiate. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're in oh, okay. negotiation mode here. I was only 17. Mm-hmm. She was like 25. And so... um Anyway, so I said, okay, MJ, I'll make a deal with you. I'll, I'll just buy the bag. You don't owe me anything, but you have to give, give me, you have to, you have to get me high on some so I could try it. So 
she said, no, no, no. But at some point she was so sick, like the devil owns you when you're a heroin addict. So wow. um, she said, oh, okay. So I went, there was like a dealer on the block. Again, it's all in my book. But anyway, so I went over, got, got what they called back then, um, a paper. A paper was a $10 bag of heroin, according to Tucson, Arizona. Okay. In the, in the se- mid-70s, you know. That's a paper. How, they called it a paper. Okay. And so that was a $10 bag of heroin. And so I went and got it. By this time in her apartment, uh, where me and her sister were staying, the lights had been turned off because they weren't paid. And it was like, you know, really crazy. But... um. So MJ did try to shoot me up, but I, his like, naturally have really small, shallow veins. I was born that way. Some people okay. are not, but I was. So it, it, I never had a needle, you know. But in my arm, so she could not get a vein because it was just like you couldn't, you can't hardly see them. They're very shallow. Okay. So she brought me down um, by the dealer. And there was a guy in there, and she was like, hey, can you do this for her? Because I can't get it. And, and while we're in her house, we're like with candlelight. You oh, know? yeah, because there's no, no lights. No right. And so she was. Just, she tried, but she couldn't. So then we go to the, the, the next corner to the dealer's house, who we went in, and then some guy took me in the bathroom, and he got the bag. And um, I never forgot that, so I was so high, like, you know, like not. Oh, so the guy ended up doing it. Yeah, he got the vein. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now this is my first time doing it. I was so high, and um, as I was walking out, the actual dealer was coming in, who would always say to me when he'd see me, you know, um, man, never touch that stuff. You're, you know, you're young. You have your whole life. You're a really pretty girl. You know. Everyone involved seems to be. At that time, it. yeah, they were against it. This little, uh, basically, it was like a little girl, right? Yeah, and yeah. so, um, even the dealer was like, "Never do this." And I'd be like, "No, I won't." And so, as I was walking out, he was walking in, and he could tell right away by my facial yeah. and the eyes pinned, and I was kind of like really high and kind of nodding. And I went to go pass by him to get out, and then he grabbed my arm and like pulled it out, and he could see the needle mark, and he was like. I can't believe you did that. He was like, now your life is ruined and you're going to lose all your looks. And then I was just like, yeah, whatever. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So that's how that started. I stayed there another month and just kept doing it every day. And every I, day? Yeah. Well, at this point, I wasn't even around MJ anymore because I knew she, how she didn't really want me to do it. So I had already been there long enough where I kind of knew her people, sure, and then would go hang with them, yeah, and um, and then she, MJ came by where I was staying and came in the bedroom, and she and she she was worried about me, and she said um, I was laying there and I was so sick, and she was like, "What are you doing?" You know, and she saw some needles on the um, end table, you know, the bed stand, you know, next to yeah, the yeah. bed, and she was like what are you doing? You know, you know, you're going to get, you're addicted now. And I was like, no, no, I'm not. And she's like, how do you feel right now? And I go, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to die. You know? And I had this needle that I had threw in the plant from the night before because I couldn't find a vein. And so it had blood and heroin in it. Sorry, everybody, this sounds gross, but that's why I say the book is brutally honest. Yeah, that's the reality. It's It's a reality. So... I thought in my head, well, you know, I got this. Maybe it'll help a little, right? And so she saw me go in the plant right through the needle that was still like about an inch of dope mixed with blood. And I picked it up and she was like, no, stop. Do you know how bad that is? And I was just like, I wouldn't even listen to her. And then I I got it in and it made me feel a little better. But she was like so mad at me, you know. She felt bad, you know, that like... You know, I don't know. She just knew what was in store for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So at 17 years old. At 17. Yeah. And I just continued on throughout my life. And when did you, because this was in Arizona, you said? Mm-hmm. 
And when did you make your way to Chicago, or was there in between? Well, I lived, grew up in Chicago, but、oh, okay. I only went there to visit、mm. with my best friend to see her older sister. I see. Yeah. So.、Um, so during a visit. Well, more than I, we ended up staying about four or five months. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then, but then we came back to Chicago. Yeah, it's still not a long time. No, 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 no. But I was addicted, and so then I had to. Find I didn't know any heroin dealers really. I mean that wasn't pills, yeah, other stuff, yeah. Right, yeah、okay. But anyway, so I had to, one night. I thought, you know, like when I first got back, I got to find a connect, you know. So I'm so by now maybe eighteen. So I go to、um, Humble Park. Okay. So I'm like, and back in those days, like Humble Park looks a whole lot nicer. But back in the seventies. It was pretty rundown, you know, and like, so anyway. But I didn't care, you know. Like I, I've kind of always been like a fearless kid, adult, whatever. I, I never think past what I'm doing. Now I do, but I didn't used to. So in the seventies, like you mentioned, Humble Park is a little better now. It's still hood, but it looks but better. better. It's got a facelift. It's got oh, I see. But in the seventies, it looked it looked like trash looked all over trash, the streets、right. and the curbs. And but the it was still was it still gang? Was、oh, gangs were beginning or was it? No, they've been there already forever. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Okay. No, like yeah. So, so you're going into a rough neighborhood to find this. Yeah, this I, stuff. I, I was kind of used to rough neighborhoods,、okay. so it didn't bother me. But so I'm just driving up and down and up and down, and then.、Um, You know, I probably look really crazy because, like, I wasn't Hispanic, and like, who is she? The police? I don't know. So I saw some guy just standing up against some building that looked like basically half abandoned, kind of like type building. And、um, I pulled over and got out of the car, and I walked up to him and I said, "Hey, look, I'm not the police or anything, but I, you know, I need." This to- is an 18-year-old white girl. Yeah, yeah, in Humble <laughs>、okay. Park. In in the old days, you know,、uh-huh. and so it, he's probably like I don't know if he's Puerto Rican or Mexican, but he、uh-huh. Hispanic guy. So、um, he was like looking at me like weird, you know, like is she the police? Is this a plant? Or and I I pull my sleeve up and I'm like, no, I'm not a cop, you know.、Oh, I、shit. just really need a cop. And then he was like, he kind of sized me up, and then he was like. I don't know whether he found me entertaining or what, but he was like,、um, "All right, follow me." So he opened a door to a, some stairs going up to this building, and and here's and he was back then. There were no plastic bottles. It was a、uh, glass of a bottle, a glass bottle of Coca Cola,、mm-hmm. and he had was drinking it.、Okay. So he's like, "Just follow me." So I go, "Okay." I, I was standing by the doorway. And I'm like, all right. He's like, follow me. And I go, I know, but you go up ten steps first, and then I'll follow you. And he was like, <laughs> why? And I go, you know, I don't really know you, just like you don't know me. And you have a、um, glass bottle in your hand, so I don't, you know, no offense, but I got to be cautious. So if you don't mind, could you put that?、Um, Glass Coca Cola bottle on the stairs and keep、oh, walking. Oh wow, you're a survivor. Yeah, so、you're、he paying kind, attention to these. I、things. think that he kind of found that amusing. Yeah, like, yeah, like this was hilarious. They probably were all gunned up and everything. Right, and I'm right, worried about worried a bottle. About, you know, <laughs> right, right? Yeah. So he was just like, yeah, whatever. So he brought me upstairs. Some like knock. He did. They opened the door. I went in, and、um, there was like one of the leaders, and I'm not going to say which、um, clique it was because I don't want、which、to.、Gang? Yeah, because I don't want to glorify. I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, these are my past, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm glorifying this life because I'm not. I'm grateful. I mean, I'm not happy that I had to go through that, but since I did, I have turned my negative hustling skills into positive negotiation skills for the betterment of the community. Great. In a way, you're not. Promoting that gang either by no, name not, dropping them. Yeah, no, right. And I don't want、right. anyone to get any cloud off any sure, interview right, that right. I do. I yeah. So it's basically about the behavior and、yeah. the lifestyle, not so much what gang, right?、Mm-hmm. So,、um, but anyway, I'm glad you、uh, cleared that up and even explained what it is. Yeah, because, that's just a、yeah. thing with me where I just won't, you know. Yeah. And、uh, anyway, so I walk in, and the head guy of that sector was like to the guy. 
the guy who brought me up was like, what are you doing? Who is she? And why are you bringing? He's like, no, no, no. She's cool. Honest. She's cool. So um, I sit down and, and it was like this room that was like, like a lot of cigarette smoke and all types of alcohol on, on like some beat up couches, probably their safe house. I don't even know. Sure. But I guess the guy probably shouldn't have brought me there, but mm. felt that he could trust me, which he could and everything was fine. So anyway, um, so they're just like, wait, well, what do you want? And I go, I need a gram of heroin, you know? And they were kind of like sizing me up and I had to, you know, kind of go through a little, some questions and where do you live? Why yeah. did you come here? Yeah. That type of stuff. So, but they sold me a gram. So then that was- So my- was it because you're young or because your ethnicity? Like what? what's so hard about selling you a gram? Well, because I'm, I- I'm a white girl and at that time I'm young and pretty and prob and you know I'm like it really- doesn't go along with the heroin thing because no, can you I just s- go buy some weed and are you, is it the same scenario? Probably not. Right. But right, now I'm okay. going into a really dangerous neighborhood at that time mm-hmm. with like high ranking gang members. And it's, the, it's the type of drug you're buying that's. Kind it's of not so much the type; it. it's the fact that I'm white and I look real polished. Okay. The the heroin had not taken hold of me to look like a full blown mm. junkie at that okay. point. So. Um, they were just kind of like, but I got, you know, like whatever. They felt comfortable with me and mm-hmm. they were cool. So then they gave it to me and I said, because I was a little bit sick, and I said, do you care if I go in the bathroom and, and do a little bit of this? And they were like, no, go ahead. So, you know, do you need a needle? I'm like, yeah. And and that's why I always, and people often ask me after they read my book, you're and even my doctors say I'm a medical miracle because after all that, obviously I'm using some used needle and I never yeah, got yeah. HIV or anything, wow. you know, crazy. I'm grateful You're to God. You're just taking whoever's needle. Well, yeah, because I, I didn't know about the scene yet. I didn't know that how, how to get brand new needles or even though they weren't legal at that time to go into a pharmacy and yeah, get them. Yeah. But there were other ways. But I was, I was kind of green on the heroin scene. But yeah, okay. because of my personality and the way, you know, I talk with people, I think they're able to feel that... Yeah, she's not trying to harm us, you know. Okay. I don't know, but anyway, so um, so I start, so I did some dope, thanked them, I left, and then that became my connect. Now you're in Humble Park. Well, I actually, your connect is in Humble Park, right? So now I got a phone, a landline. Yeah. There were no cell phones, so I got a landline I could call. Yeah. Where they, the the first original guy Matt would say, yeah, sure, you know. Then it turned into me buying. Because I thought, oh, wow, I could sell this and um, make some money to support my habit. So it went from like me buying a personal use. Oh, you started selling heroin too? Yes. Okay. And so then um, it went from me like buying a gram just for myself to have for a few days or whatever to then, hey, I'd go in that, that apartment and talk with the leader and um, say, hey, how much would you charge me for a quarter ounce of heroin? And then, and then, it, and then it eventually went to an ounce. You know, yeah. Back in those days, it was so this means that you're basically, you know, people that do heroin enough people to be able to oh yeah break it up and yeah almost and yeah, yeah. and I'm not proud of this, but unfortunately, I was not like MJ. Yeah, I was kind of like my friends would be like, "What is it that you're high on?" I'm like, "Heroin. You should try it." You oh. know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah i was not like no 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 yeah. i mean I, I don't think i meant any harm in my head sure. i wasn't trying to make somebody have a r- horrible life yeah but i don't know you know i was like oh my god it's so good and so that i had like a lot of customers and then other people just spread that you know she's got this good dope because they were giving me pretty good dope like uncut and um back in those days it was mexican mud it was called mm-hmm. and it was tar okay. so I would have to put it in one of those coffee grinders with okay. a cut. Yeah. Now I didn't put a lot. I didn't cut it a lot. So I uh, and I somehow had some business mind, where I'm not. I'm gonna make really like good bags. You're still gonna have good stuff. And I'm gonna make them a little bit bigger. Oh wow! And yeah. so I'm gonna get all the business. You're the go-to. Yeah, and so like <laughs> other gangs were like hearing. You know, Bianca's got this tip and spot and yeah i ran into some problems but i didn't care you know like whatever so you ended up being associated with the gang because so after that that, because of me making all those trips and selling then the first indication that they were starting to trust me 
is um, they said, because they used to buy like kilos in um, Uptown, like okay. on Magnolia was like a courtyard building. We're talking like now, maybe the 80s, right? Okay. And so from Cubans. And so um, mind you, it wasn't that long ago that I saw the movie Scarface, right? Uh-huh. So it, this is, I think, real crazy. But anyway, so they're they're thinking the leaders and higher up are thinking, well, we have to pick up five kilos from Uptown. So it looks more suspicious to send a Hispanic person in that building, yeah. but probably not a white girl. Yeah. And the leader was like who you wanted to talk about, Papo, Papo, of that sector. And um, he was like, we can 100% trust her. She's real down, you know? So he was like, you know, here's, and that's a lot of money to buy five kilos of heroin back in those days, you know? Yeah. And so um, they trusted me. I said, sure, no problem. I'm not scared, you know? So I um, took the money, had the money, went into the, courtyard building in uptown knocked on the door all these cubans and once i realized they were cubans because i didn't initially know that and so i couldn't help but to think of the scarface movie yeah where they saw the guy in in the bathroom you know in the tub and so yeah and so then that was my thought but it went well like they gave me the joke the five kilos i gave them the money so but when i left i was like you know what you need to learn spanish at least some words you that, didn't know Spanish? No. I mean, oh, yeah. like anybody else, gracias, sure. maybe. Sure. You know, or I, I, didn't, I wouldn't even know how to and say And you it. ran into Spanish speaking? Is that why you're saying this? So I began, yeah, so I speak Spanish. So No, I'm saying, did you, when, during that drug deal? They spoke English. Okay. But they were also speaking in Spanish. So they could have been saying each, something. They could have been saying, yeah. take her money and yeah. take her in the bathroom and kill her. Right. And then we're going to dump her in the alley, yeah. you know? So I, I, I was like, I don't know. But yeah. like I kept going back to the movie Scarface. So when I left, I ended up doing about five, six of those. But from the first time to the second time, I, I was like telling the guys in Humble Park, but so how do you say murder, kill? You know, like I needed to know these words, you know, kilo, ounce, Mm -hmm. gram, you know, um, you know, money, you know, like, so I started learning, so I knew all these words and that words at least. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. And then, um, so I could hear if it's like, you know, dinero, quítale el dinero. Yeah. 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 And, and kill her, you know? So I, I would hear that. So I would know, but that never happened. All went well. And um, they did, the peop- the gang trusted me. And then um, uh, before I became a member, um, there was another situation <clears throat> where somebody, I had no, no knowledge of this, but somebody um, killed four people and, um, in New York. And so like there was this active warrant search for this man, right, who was said to be in Humble Park. And so was that gang related? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but it was in New York, and then he came to Chicago. But he was affiliated with the same gang. Okay. And so, um, at one point, um, the Chicago, you know, drug people, yeah, whatever, you know, the drug unit raided a safe house, and I was in the safe house, the only white girl. There were a couple black guys and majority Hispanic. And whether Puerto Rican or Mexican, whatever. So um, they got us up against the wall. I literally had my baby with me, my son, (laughs) Sean, the one you met. Yeah, yeah. And he was like a year. So on the way there, because I. So when you say safe house, are you talking about were you in prison and then went to a safe house? No, no, a safe house. The gang's safe house. house, Oh, okay. Where nobody knows where it's at unless you're in the know and they trust you. And then the narcotics office. That's where they bag the dope. Okay. And make their little, you know. um, Yeah, yeah. Package it, you know, like a, a bundle or, or a jab, mm-hmm. how we call it in mm-hmm. newer days. But anyway, so that's where they're, um, uh, and I would be involved in that around big round table. We all had to wear masks and gloves okay. and putting the tar in the coffee grinder, you know, with the cut yeah. and then err. Uh, Was and this then, your recipe? No, no, it was theirs. That's how I learned it. So oh, okay. I could become okay. a drug dealer. I learned. I see. Yeah, they were my mentors, great mentors, right? <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. 
The police raided it, kicked the doors in. Okay. And so they so they really didn't care about the drugs that were on the table. They were specifically looking for this man who the allegedly murder, yeah. allegedly killed these four people. So some snitches in the community in Humble Park were like, I don't know, but like they'd pay them bags, you know. I don't know if they still do that, sure, but they did sure. back then. Yeah, and they'd be like, ideas. well, all I know is he's really cool with this some white girl. And so now here I am, the only white girl there. Oh, so yeah. they run all, I, I did have a, a license and, you know, they ran, I had a warrant for seven, it was a, so I don't know what it was for, but there was a $750 cash bond. So one of the brothers was like, they told, the police were like, you have a warrant, we're placing you under arrest. And so my, here's my baby, you know, I bring him on the way to the safe house, I'd get the Happy Meal. Yeah. And I'd like, there's no furniture in these houses, just the table, the, you know, yeah. so I put him in like another bedroom uh, with nothing, just Empty. sitting, sitting on the floor so he wouldn't get fumes uh -huh. and with his little happy meal. And he was always so happy with his little McDonald toy. And okay. I don't know, I guess I saw nothing wrong with this picture. But anyway, so um, the police ran my name, I had a warrant, they were taking me into custody. And but since the snitches said that I knew this individual and I was pretty, they've seen me with him. Yeah. I didn't ask. I don't ask those questions. Have you ever killed anybody? I don't. Yeah. That's not my business, you know. Anyway, so instead of taking me to the lockup to get bonded out, they took me to um, the infamous Holman Avenue, okay. where I don't know if you ever heard of that. I don't think so. What is that? So back in the day, I don't think that happens anymore. But I have no clue. I'm a law-abiding citizen, but. Um, back in the day, especially back then, that was like a, uh, like they brutally, brutally, like they probably didn't beat me up because I'm a girl, but like you literally are interrogation under, to, total. They had me for three days and, wow. um, yeah. And like you're, they're not giving you water and maybe once in a while and they're, you're in a room. This is what you see in like military movies. Yeah. Well, this is how it was. Wow. The infamous home, Holman Avenue, um, lockup or whatever. Oh, okay. Well, actually it's not even a lockup. It just to interrogate. It's like when you watch Chicago PD yeah. and, and they bring you in that basement with those cages uh -huh. and then like, um, Sergeant Hank comes in Okay. And nobody could see anything, and then he's he threatens and all that. It was simply like that, except for rooms where they had these bright lights on you, and you know, yeah, crazy. But they were showing me all the, and I really knew nothing about the murders. I really didn't. Okay. And but I did know the man they were talking about. But I said I didn't know him. I don't know what you were told, but I don't. I'm not incriminating myself because I did. I wasn't involved. So they were showing me these four brutally. P pictures of men brutally murdered, like really bad. So I kept looking. They're like, and so you don't know any da da da, you know. And I said, oh wow, these are horrible. This is horrible. Whoever did this, I hope you catch them. You know, I don't know anything. And this went on for three days. So finally, they're just like, we're not getting anything out of her. So they took me to um, I don't know some nearest CPD lockup mm -hmm. for my warrants. Oh, and yeah. one of the brothers then knew that and came and bonded me out. Yeah. But when they were arresting me, they were like, is this your kid? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, all right, we're going to call DCFS. And I was like, no, oh, no. Shit. And so one of the um, higher ups yeah. brothers um, said, no, 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 no. I'll take the baby. My grandmother will take good care of her baby. So I didn't actually even know where my baby was, wow. but I knew that that baby was being, my baby was being taken care of. I knew this for wow. sure. And so my, I, when I, they bonded me out, but they didn't wait for me because it's not a good luck to like get in the car with another criminal. Yeah, yeah. So um, my stepmother picked me up and she was like, okay, let's go pick the baby up. And I was like, okay. So we're driving around Hummel Park and she's like, do you know where your baby is? <laughs> oh my god! I know. So you didn't. You I didn't. didn't. I I said I I, I guarantee. Is my stepmother? I said Pat. I guarantee you the baby is being well taken care of. Yeah. 
And I even said, Spanish people take really good care of babies. Yeah, they're okay? family oriented. Yeah, yeah. People, yeah. I was like, so we have nothing. To, he, he he's with a grandmother of somebody. So fine, but she's like, so what are we doing? I go, we're driving around till I see one of the guys to let them know I'm out and so I can get my baby, which we did. My my stepmother was just like, what is going on? You know. Yeah. So then I did. Uh, so I ran on the guys who went to a payphone. Because it's our only phone, yeah. And called the brother whose grandmother had the baby, and he went and picked up the baby and brought it back. Now my son came back so happy <laughs> with toys and a new outfit, oh my God. and like extra diapers. And I was like, "See, I told you, Spanish people take really yeah. good care." I don't know if I could even say that today. Would that be like some? I think it's still a thing. Yeah, I mean they're very good with children. Not yeah. not everybody. I'm not saying abuse right, doesn't right. happen. Still, they're still, the... but the majority, right, you know, right. and a grandmother. Come on, yeah. you know. But anyway, mm-hmm. so. Um, Pat, my stepmother, was like, okay, we're going to leave this part of the story out from your father. We're just going to say we came and got the baby, oh, wow. you know? Yeah. Okay. Sounds so he bad. was fine, you know? And then, um, anyway, so after that, where the the brothers of that gang and the sisters were all like, yeah, she's really down. She didn't crack she didn't under trick. pressure. She didn't wreck. She didn't even say she knew the guy, mm-hmm. you know, which, like, I knew him. But I did not know he did these murders. Yeah. So what's the point here? I can't. There's nothing I could tell you, you know. And it, I, I, at that time, I'd never been to New York. So where are we going with this? You know, I don't know anything. And they they don't disclose that kind of stuff. Like you know, oh, and by the way, you know. So um, then Papo, who you you'll later talk about, um, Papo was like, you know, no, she is like really down. And actually, for these this year we've known her coming around, she's actually more um, trustworthy and gangster than some of the brothers, you know? Damn. And then he was like, do you, do you want to become... Yeah, I said, yeah. He's like, you got to be jumped in. So I had to be jumped in. So they, they beat, beat me up. up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like crazy. When I think back now, I'm like, you literally... Was it girls or was it guys? Oh, no, it's girls. The guys can't jump in a girl. Okay. So you get a choice. You could walk the line, which means there's um, female members on, on each side. On each side, and you can't hit back. You just got to walk slowly past this long, like you know, at a wedding or something. Uh-huh. And they give give your butt the best their best effort punch. So you you know you're bruised up and stuff. Yeah. So or I could choose three minutes on the wall. Three minutes. Yeah. The longest three minutes of my life. Is That's that what, what you I chose. Yeah. So um, they they um, chose to jump me in. Well, there was one female who was timing it. Yeah. The old fashioned stopwatch, uh-huh. you know. And then um, I had to stand against the wall, and it was one of my like out of the sisters. Like me and her were really close. Okay. So that they chose her and another girl, and. Um, her name was Blondie. Anyway, um, so she didn't want to beat me up. You know what I mean? And so, and I was just like, I kept, she had to because they gave the word that yeah, yeah. she better come out bruised or you're going to get, you know, violated. So she was just like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Every, every blow. Every time she hit and, you. I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then I was like, just do it. Just do it. And then, uh, like, the girl with the clock, I, it felt like an hour. I'm not yeah, kidding. Yeah. I mean, just stand there for three minutes. You can't react. Yeah. So I was bruised all over my shoulders and my chest and my face, you know. And so then afterwards, it was like a thing where, you know, the upper people look. you got to show you're sh- bruised. Like, you really, she really did this. Yeah. Or she would have gotten in trouble. Yeah. So, and she was like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. You know, it's over now. And so... um then they were. Then it's like a lot of love and hugs. Now you're part of us, you know. And yeah. I stayed with them for a very long time. Wow. So I mean, you were part of this gang now. Yeah, I was and, an official member. And this, this, uh, the leader Papo. Mm-hmm. Um, he ended up getting killed. Mm-hmm. With me right next and to him. And you were with him. So can you tell us your experience? What happened there? So Papo. Not an intimate relationship, but a little older than me. 
but he really saw something in me and was like a major mentor to me. Again, like, okay, <laughs> like not the kind of mentor I want my grandchildren to have. Sure, sure. But anyway, so he, he taught me a lot, you know, and we were very close. And he, he did have a, a girlfriend, and um, I was cool with her. Everyone knew I wasn't having, I wasn't intimate. That, that He just trusted me a lot, yeah, you know? Yeah. So um, he ended up getting hooked on heroin himself. Okay. So there were, were a lot of um, violations coming his way because it's so weird. But in the bylaws, it says, literally says, that no member can sell heroin or cocaine or, you know, or do it or whatever, even sell it. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> like we're all selling heroin and we're all doing heroin, you know, and coke. I didn't, but others did. Yeah. And we're selling it. So, but you know, whatever, you know, you, you're, you do what you see. Right. So, but he started getting really bad on heroin, like literally sitting in the park in Humble Park, like closer to North Avenue. Yeah. And like, you know, he was just really full of himself and, you know, Poriqua and, yeah, you know, yeah. all this stuff like that. And so he would just shoot up right there. He didn't care. He thought he was invincible. So, um, like I said, I was very close with him. And then I went to the penitentiary and in January of 1988. And then I got out in, like, October. And then I was right back hanging with them. But I didn't have a car, so I would call a landline and Papo and his girl would pick me up at the L. They got off right there. Oh, okay. Kind of like Wicker Park, but all, almost humble, right yeah. next to yeah. it. I think it's Damon, maybe. I, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, yeah. so I'd come down, and I'd get in the car, and we'd go on our daily adventures, whatever we were doing, you know? So um, as time went by, I, I knew we all knew he was getting violations and even like an SOS, shoot on sight. Yeah. That's usually a leg shot. You don't die, but a warning um, so he was getting a lot of violations, and um, I had heard a rumor that he robbed another brother in the same gang um, okay. of like a pound of coke. I'm not, don't quote me; I'm not sure. That's just a rumor I heard. Yeah, yeah. But then, um, so one day, I he picked him and his girlfriend picked me up at the L, the Blue Line, then, and um, I get in the car. And then, so we're, you know, he had dope and all that. Anyway, but his girlfriend didn't get high. Okay. And so I'm in the back seat, and uh, he's like, yeah, Bianca, my days are numbered. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Because like I said, I was really close with him, like family. Yeah. And um, so uh, he said to me, there's a hit out on me, because now finally... They had enough now because he continued to do this, and um, it came. The hit came down from I don't know what penitentiary, but some penitentiary of a huge leader that's probably doing you know I don't know how probably life fifty times I don't know. But this is beyond the uh, SOS. This is kill. This is kill you now. Yeah, yeah you. Yeah. Th this is the ultimate punishment. Mm -hmm. So he told like it's almost like he reserve he came to real like he accepted that you know okay. he knew there was nothing he could do so when he told me that i was like oh my god no 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 there must be something we could do what could we do and he was like no just forget it so i was just like really upset about hearing that you know that there was a a kill hit on him yeah so um anyway so he pulls into humble park at some point we're doing what we have to do whatever driving around at some point, we pull into actual Humble Park, and he says, come on, I want you to try th this new, new batch of heroin I have. Let's just go, because like, now it's different in Humble Park. A lot of the trees are cut down. Okay. But back then, there were a lot of trees and bushes, and you could go in a nook and cranny okay. without anybody seeing you, right? Yeah. So he was like, come on, Bianca. So um, you know, I get out the car. His girlfriend's staying in the car. And we get like five feet from the car, and he goes, "Oh, I forgot my piece." And I go, "His gun." His gun. And I said, "Oh, no, no, no! Wait, hold on. Let me run back to the car and get it." And then he was like, "You know what? Just forget it. I'm cool." And I was like, "No, no, you need your gun because I'm thinking of the kill thing, yeah, you know." Yeah. And then he's like, "No, just leave it. It's okay. Come on, let's go." So we start walking to like almost to the baseball field. 
okay. where we're going to go a little around it, where there's some like shade and trees and yeah. stuff where we could do a quick bag. And a car pulled up. We were, um, our backs were to the car, and whoever got out of the car, I don't know who they were, and um, you hear Papo. So he turned around, and I turned around to look at them. Again, I did not know who they were. And um, all of a sudden, pa, pa, like, like two people shooting, you know, and each bullet hit him, like, in succession, and, like, almost, like, you know. Jerked him around. Yeah, yeah, but he was, like, he was holding my arm. I'm so you're in, standing right I'm next standing to him. right next to him. Why they didn't kill me, I don't know to this day, but it is the absolute truth what happened. And um, maybe because it was a hit, you know, on him, and maybe they knew I wasn't going to say, I don't know what, but I was so traumatized. I mean, you're even lucky that one of the bullets didn't, didn't hit you, hit even me. though they're aiming at right. him. Right, but they all got him. I guess wow. they were good shooters, I don't know. Yeah, I but, mean, that's... Um, but anyway, so he's holding my arm, and he's hit, getting all these shots in his chest, and the whole time, he's literally talking like Tony Montana being shot up, you know, in the movie Scarface. Yeah, what's like, he saying? He's swearing, you know, F you, wow. U M F, you know, I, I'm Pavo, you know. Getting like, shot. Yeah, but he was yeah, not the, he was not dying easy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So then I guess the guns emptied and before they could reload, he he grabs my arm and just like turns us around like as if we're just going to walk out of there. He's already got about 12 bullets in yeah. him. You know, he's bleeding profusely. I got blood on me. And um his blood on you. Yeah, his blood on me. And you're walking away. Like nothing well, happened. Yeah, I'm traumatized, but I'm just moving with them. But those people, those guys reloaded and now are shooting him in the back. But he's still walking and swearing and F you and, you know, like we're just going to walk out of it and everything's going to be fine. And then at some point he dropped to the ground and, um, and they left. And so I dropped to the ground like, Papo, get up, wake up. I'm trying to like do something. What can I do? You know? And there were no cell phones, you know. And anyway, another car pulled up, and there were some brothers that I recognized. And you could hear ambulances in, in the background, like coming, you know. Yeah. Sirens. Sirens. Uh, police, yeah. ambulance. I don't know. Anyway, the guys that I did know came up to me, and they were like, come on, we got to go. And I was like, no, no, I can't leave, that. leave him. No, no. And they were like, he's gone, Bianca. He's gone. He's gone. You know, you got to get out of here. We, we're, we're trying to save you from an intensive interrogation. You know, yeah. we got to get you out of here. So and back then there were no cameras and stuff. So I was fighting them not to go. I just, I thought I was so, I was just in shock. Right. Yeah. So they, but they got me in the car and they took me somewhere else where I got different clothes and took all my clothes and we burned them, all the blood. It was like, the, it's like something out of a movie, yeah, I swear. Yeah. But um, yeah, and he did die. And I did go to his funeral. And, um, you know, his actual blood brothers took me outside. Everyone knew I was there, but not so much the news, you know, because I was gone by then. Yeah. But um, they were like, okay, can you describe the guys? And I kept yeah. thinking, because I, you know, throughout it all, I w I've never had an arrest for a violent crime. It's all nonviolence. Though I was oh, okay. around a lot of violence, yeah. you know. And again, I've been shot myself. N not the target, but a ricocheted bullet. But anyway, but at that time, you know, uh, I kind of wasn't okay with that. I didn't like that. But I was already kind of deep into it, into the dealing and the you drug didn't addiction. Like what? Violence. Okay. Like when I would just be here on the block, I think I always had this naturally in me where they'd be talking about something and I'd be like, man, look, you guys stop. You could work that out. Yeah, you weren't like into the adrenaline of let's go do a drive by. No, I would never, okay. you know? And so I'd be like, man, like, look, you could get killed, you know? And, you know, not that they'd listen to me, but sometimes maybe for a minute. I don't know. Sure. But I do remember at a young age being like that. So it makes sense why when I changed my life, I threw my whole being into 
uh, being an anti-violence activist. So, but anyway, so with that happening, I did go to his funeral when the, his blood brothers took me outside and I just, I didn't want any more violence, you know? So I wasn't even going to say, well, one hair, kind of red hair, or bron- mm-hmm. blonde hair, I whatever. So I said, no, I didn't recognize them at all. I don't even remember. I was just looking at Papo. You, you didn't even... Acknowledge, yeah, no. Because you didn't want there to be a, a No, because a then there'd be a retaliation, you know? And we couldn't bring Papo back, you know? So anyway, I was devastated by his death. Um, like I said, we were very good friends, and... You know, he's one of the first that I met, opposed to the man with the Coca-Cola bottle who brought yeah, me to yeah. him. You know, <laughs> excuse and, me. And I mean, um, you witnessed him die. It was the first murder I ever saw or been there. And you mentioned you've gotten shot yourself. Yes. So you've been around getting shot at and getting shot yourself. Yeah. Well, what happened when you got shot? So that was in like 1996-ish. And my then man, who I was with for many, many years, who I have children by, Blue, he's now passed on. But um, crazy, I've been married three times, and I outlived all, all even I've out, I have outlived all my boyfriends and all my husbands. Isn't that crazy? Oh my God, yeah. I know. I have a guardian angels, I believe. There's something surrounding yeah, you. Yeah, you've something. Been through a lot. Yeah. So um, in 1996 ish. So I lived for many years in the projects. Well, Pulaski and uh, Fifth Avenue, that whole area there, because oh, okay. my baby daddy's mother lived on Fifth Avenue. So it was there. And then we basically had a play apartment in the um, village, the Abla projects, uh, housing projects okay. on Ashland and Roosevelt. Okay. As we and all your viewers know, all the projects have been torn down. Yeah. But um, that's where we lived in 1510, and they used to call it DVG, Death Valley Gangster. So anyway, so I was around this all my life, and I think as I got older, I guess I thought, because I'm slowly losing family members, I'm burning bridges, I really had nobody other than my baby daddy and the people I knew or hung with, whatever, criminal people, yeah, you know? Yeah. I was in that lifestyle. And um, so my baby daddy, he was very, he thought he was invincible. But everyone knows that the street never forgets. Mm-hmm. So if you kill somebody 20 years ago and you get out of jail, whatever those family members are, they have not forgot that. And yeah. if they're involved in high risk street activity, likely you will be a target. So, or you do something to them, right? Yeah. So my baby daddy, Blue, um, had somehow managed to get close to one of the main ballers in the Ickies um, on Cermak and State and got her to confide in where their safe house was. And those were a whole different opposition gang than us, you know? So, um, and then he went in and robbed that safe house and got like pounds of cocaine. So a year goes by, nobody forgets that. Right. You know, so anyway, so we pull up and he knows, he's like baby wait in the car. And I'm like, Blue, you can't go in. What is wrong with you? It's at night. You know, and he's like, no, 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 nobody's going to know. And so I'm I'm like, I kind of knew. And so then I'm sitting in the car, I'm sitting in the car, and and where they were selling the dope at that time was about the fifth or sixth floor in the hall of the projects. So I'm waiting kind of a long time, and now I, I got this sick feeling, you know. So, and I don't know, I used to always do this with Blue. I'd get out of the car. I have no gun. I don't, you know, like, what am I going to do? You know, but somehow I think I could save everybody, you know. So I I said, oh, forget that. I get out of the car and I go in the building. And as I'm almost to the floor where they're selling the dope, they did recognize Blue. And so they they were trying to play it off like like it was going to like there was all these customers and like everybody get up against the wall, like as if they were gonna rob the, the customers, like some random people, not the dealers. 
And but really, they were trying to single out Blue. Oh, without letting them know. Correct. And so, but he caught on, and he he took off down the stairs. Now, many of your viewer your viewers won't know the action with the staircases and the projects, but there is two staircases that connect to the like one side, and then they don't connect. But you know, there's two staircases. Okay. So um, when you're at uh, if somebody's chasing you, you don't run down the stairs. You hold the banister and slide down. The okay. next one, slide down. That's how you do it in the projects to get away. Yeah. Whether it's the police or... So they're narrow enough to kind of... Yeah, you can you reach each side. A, each, each hand holds a... Yeah, so it's like a, a flight. Yep. You slide down and yep. turn. Slide yep. down, slide down. So, um, and, and, But the shooters, they wanted to kill Blue. And so, or got, I don't know, you know, for what he did. Yeah. And so as soon as I get up there, he's like, baby, turn around, run, run, run. So I'm just like, I'm hearing all these shots. And so typically when you run, we get out the building, but there's so many gunshots, just like they say, if you were in a war, you're hearing all these gunshots. Often you don't even know you've been shot. Yeah. Right? And you don't feel it because the adrenaline that you're going through yeah. being shot at. Yeah. So I had that. So he did get shot multiple times and a, a bullet ricocheted or something and went through my leg. And okay. I didn't even know that. So we usually when you get out the building, if it's for something else, but this was kind of a big deal because he robbed them. Yeah. Um, so they wanted to kill him. So they chased us still out the building. This is at night. And that's usually you get out the building, they're not coming out, you know, but because you risk being seen by the police or whatever, you know, yeah. but they didn't care. They were trying to kill him. So we're running and running. Now, all that adrenaline, I'm bleeding a lot. I'm losing a lot of blood. I don't even know I'm shot. So um, it's, I start running to get close to the corner. And it's like wrought iron type fence and a little brick corner thing you know that's how the ickies looked mm -hmm. and i get close to cermak and stage i'm almost there and then i felt a pain in my leg and then i looked down and there's all this blood and so but i have to keep running because these people are chasing us they're going to kill us both probably so as soon as i get close to the that corner of cermak and and uh and uh state street I just happen to see a police car moving along, turn the corner, hears it, puts the sirens, lights oh. on. And I remember in, in my lifestyle, the past lifestyle, nobody wants to see a police officer, yeah. you know? So, but I remember the last thing I thought about before I passed out was, oh my God, I've never been so happy to see it. The police, oh you know? My God. Yeah, yeah, and they put the lights on. So the shooters then stopped and ran, ran and got away. Yeah. But we were both shot. And so I wake up in the hospital, and um, uh, anyway, so I didn't want to be in the hospital. My baby Daddy Blue had to be in the hospital because he was shot so bad. He was there about seven months, and oh, he had like wow. damage and surgeries. But the, he ended up okay though. But um, my one bullet going through my leg. Um, when I woke up, I was just like, kind of like, okay, can you just give me? I'm checking myself out. And they're like, I'm like, is there something you could do for my leg? And they're like, well, you know, you just got shot. A bullet just went in your leg. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. I feel fine, you know, because <laughs> I'm thinking I need some heroin, right? Oh, so shit. I'm like, um, just give me some crutches. I'm signing myself out. And they're like, you're signing yourself out against um, a medical advice. And I actually gave a fake name. I didn't even give my real name. Oh, okay. Because, I, I mean, I'm just, like, all freaked out. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, I got shot. I don't want anybody to know. So I gave some fake name. I had no ID, so whatever. So I checked myself out. And, uh, yeah, that's how it went. And and I would continue to go and visit uh, Blue. But he was in there for a long time, like, seven, eight months. And had to relearn to kind of walk. And Damn. kind of forever walk with a very slight limp. Very, yeah. you, not so noticeable, but... Yeah, they messed him up, but he was shot multiple times. But yeah, so there, and then um, before you go on to anything else, in 1997, he um, got shot by the police. 
Oh, really? And a traffic stop. Now he had no guns, no drugs, nothing other than not having a license, right? But the detectives that pulled him over knew him, and he was like well known. He was like had an eight by ten at, on 18th um, Street, and off of, you know um, the police uh, area one police. I don't know what it is, but it's on 18th near State. Okay. Okay. So yeah, seventeenth and state over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. The station. Yeah. Yeah, the station. So when you walk out the back door, like where police go, yeah. Or if 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 the police are taking a, 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 a someone in custody to the bus to go to the county, yeah. You see these ten eight by ten photos. Yeah. And at the top it says ten most wanted uh, violators. Of what does it say? Violators of, I don't know, something to do with, oh man, um, public safety or something like, okay. like he, he might pickpocket you. It was like that type of yeah, like yeah. big time hustlers, like quality of life violators. That's mm, what it was. Mm. 10 most wanted quality of life violators. And there's his picture. And I'm just like, oh God, you know? So, um, so anyway, so they always pulled him over because they always knew he was probably on some BS. And, you know, anyway, I was actually pregnant. And so, and it's in the book also. So I won't go into too much detail in case anybody wants to buy the book. Um, but uh, he he didn't come home. So, so they pulled him over and they opened the passenger door and they were getting in the car. Now, he knew these detectives and they knew him and they hated him and they already had their guns drawn and so back then we didn't call it unarmed black man shot by police you know okay or unarmed man of color shot by police you know so we didn't say that so um he he went so he he tried to struggle with the gun to push it down so because he was in fear that they would shoot him because they hated him so bad so the gun, they did shoot him, that went in his leg and st- stayed in his leg. Oh, okay. So, but he somehow got away and came home. Oh, my God. Really late, though. And so, he, so I'm on the couch. I'm like seven months pregnant. And um, I hear the key. And he comes in. And he's like, bae, bae, they shot me. They shot me. And I, so I, I don't believe him. And I'm like, blow, stop it. I don't care that you've been gone all night. Just go take a shower and go to sleep. And then he sat in the recliner in the front room, and he's like, baby, the people shot me. I'm like, what do you mean the people? The police? And he's like, yeah. And at that time, and I talk about this sometimes, I really didn't quite grasp that situation. And I was like, stop it. What did you do? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I didn't yeah. quite, quite grasp, you know, like that that really happens, you know? And I was like, so I get up and I see all oh, this blood, right? So I'm like, oh my God. And he's like, I still got a bullet in my leg. You you got to take it out. Oh my God. Because you can't go to the hospital. They'll call the police. Yeah. So I was like, and by now it's getting light out. So he goes and lays in the bed and he's just in his briefs. And he's holding his leg up. So I go, no, 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 wait. I got to I gotta go to Walgreens. I got to get some supplies, you know? And he's just like, what do you, what do you want to dig, dig it out with my hand? You know, I mean, stop. <laughs> so I go to Walgreens and I buy those. And you're down. You're like, I'll take the bullet out. I'll take the bullet out, yeah. <laughs> so I go get peroxide, a bottle of whiskey. Um, okay, okay. Uh, needle, an actual thread. Mm-hmm, and- to sew up the wound. <laughs> Crazy. And so, um, and I bought a bag of dope and then I bought like alcohol to sterilize and I bought the little clip like that we used to use as a roach clip. It was, it's really a medical device to to hold off, you know, shut arteries or whatever. Okay. The clip thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I got one of those and other little instruments and I come back and I hand him the bottle of, of Jack Daniels and he's like, what are you doing? Why are you giving me whiskey? And I'm like. I, just drink it so you don't feel so much pain. And he's like, so then he, I go, here, snort this bag. And then um, he's seeing me with like gauze and like needle and thread. He's like, where, 
have you taken a bullet out before? I'm like, no, never. And he's like, where are you coming up with this stuff? And I'm like, I watch a lot of gun smoke. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah. So I always see Doc, you know, give the whiskey and I'm Uh thinking all uh these things are going to help. I don't know. So I'm like, just keep drinking the whiskey. So he's holding his leg because it, it, like the biggest hole, it went in through the front Mm -hmm. or no, it went in through the back, but stayed. So the only hole that I could get it, at was like the meat part of the back top above between the knee and the hip. So he's holding his leg up. He's screaming at me, just get it out, but with uh, colorful words, you know? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm like, I am, shut up, you know? So I'm like, give me the whiskey. And I, I take a sip of it because I'm like, I'm like, oh God, you know? So then I take the clips and I, I stick it in. And, and it hurts, you know? And it really creeped me out too because I could feel the flush. Mm-hmm. And at some point I feel a little metal, the slug. Mm-hmm. And I clip onto it and I'm trying to pull it out and then I lose it. Oh my god. Now I gotta I gotta repeat this like three, four times oh my god. till I finally get the bullet out. You got it out? I did. And then I poured hydrogen peroxide. He's screaming. I'm soaking the instruments. Then I'm soaking, I put alcohol, he's screaming more. I'm like, here here's the whiskey, you know? And then um and then anyway, I I gauzed it. I actually threaded a needle. Yeah. And s- He's like you so you sewed him up. I stitched him up oh with a needle God. and th- actual real clothing. Yeah, you know, and I, yeah. I, you know, that was creepy. But I forced myself and did it. And um, anyway, the police obviously were looking for him because they had to explain why they discharged their weapon. Yeah, and um, so they said that he was trying to disarm a peace oh, officer, okay. which actually was not the case. But anyway. And what was the reason why you pulled him over? Right. You know, like right. how would you know he didn't right. have a license if you didn't know him? But you know that was back a long time ago. So, and and I'm not a police basher. I'm very respectful to police. I feel that, you know, I I try in my mind. I'm thinking if I'm kind to everybody, and a, and a crooked cop is about to do something unethical. Yeah. Maybe I, I'm hoping he'll think that I said thank you for your service and you're risking your life. And maybe that cop might think, wait, I did take an oath. Maybe I better not do this. Yeah. Probably not going to think that, but I'm hoping, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not a police basher, but this is the truth what happened then. So anyway, so um, about a week goes by, and they do catch him. I don't know they have him at 11th and State, the then police lockup. And. Um, I'm walking somewhere uh, the, that same day later. They pick me up. So okay. after I took the bullet out, the slug, yeah. I, I don't know where I... I watched so much TV. Anyway, so I got this huge, big plastic bag and a small, like an old-fashioned sandwich bags. I put the slug in there, tied it in a little plastic thing, put it in a, in a plastic bag. I took all his clothes, everything... And then I washed him, not the clothes, him. I put all the bloody clothes in the bag, tied it, went out in the back of the projects, dug a hole, and buried it. Oh, my God. Like, who thinks of this, you know? I mean, weird. But anyway, so the police actually needed that stuff for because, you know, for the trajectory of how the bullet went. I don't know what they were saying, that, okay. why they did it, but they needed it. But um, so they were asking him... And I think he succumbed to like, yeah, okay, you know, I got away. And they, so they, initially they took him to Cook County, Stroger, well, it was still a Cook County Hospital back then, mm-hmm. and um, to have him checked out because they shot him and they had to have a report that he was medically okay. And he told me that the doctors were like, wow, who took this bullet out? They actually did a really good job. You know? <laughs> it's like my baby mama, you know, they're oh like, my God. is she a nurse or something? No, she's, no, I don't know. She said she watches Gunsmoke and just, they were laughing, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so I don't know that Blue is in the lockup. And so they come back where they have me held. They're not charging me, but they want to know, do you know where the bloody clothes are, Yeah, the slug is gone. And I'm like, I don't know nothing. I wouldn't break. So then finally they come down. They said, well, Blue told us to tell you to give us that you do know where this is and for you to give it to us. 
And I said, yeah, right. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to believe that one. Mm-hmm. So you want me to believe that one? You bring Blue right in front of me and let him tell me himself. Because I didn't know they had him. Yeah. But they did. They brought him down. Oh, okay. And he was like, look, baby, it's okay. I'm licked. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, you know, whatever. So he said, they're not going to charge you, but give them the the slug <laughs> Show them where you buried it. That's the first they heard that it was buried. And they were just like, oh, my God, you know, this girl (laughs) who's seven months pregnant, you know. So anyway, so I take them to the spot. And uh, I I told them, you better bring a shovel, you know. So they had a shovel. And so they hand it to me. And I'm like, I'm seven and a half months pregnant. Do I look like I'm going to shovel? You want the stuff. You dig it. You know, I'm telling you where to dig. Yeah. So they dug. They pulled it out. Everything was there. And Jesus. yeah, they wow. were just like so crazy, crazy yeah. like a movie, right? Mm-hmm. But anyway, so they took it. And he actually did get um, three years at 50% for attempting to disarm a peace officer, which he was not. He was pushing the gun away so they wouldn't shoot him. And these two detectives, they were like citywide tech officers. They were brutal anyway, and they hated us, you know. But anyway, so, and I think both are dead now, so may they rest in peace. But that's the story, crazy. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, you've been through a so lot, much. and there's and the book is actually the tip of the iceberg. I could I could write me uh, me and my co-author Linda yeah. Backstrom. We could write ten more shout books. Shout out to Linda. Yeah, shout out to my brilliant writer, yeah, awesome. Linda Backstrom. Yeah, she's I wanted wonderful. to ask you since you've been through so much, what have you done, or what do you do to cope? to get through the trauma you know to i try act- to live a normal life i live a normal life and i don't somehow i don't know i don't have trauma from that i mean at the time yeah with papo and this and that and all this crazy stuff at the time you did but you're saying it for yeah. a minute for a day and then it's just like okay forget that let's move on you know okay so it doesn't follow you well like now i'm over 13 years clean sober productive, law-abiding. I don't even park one inch over a yellow line. I will contemplate that and then go, oh, <laughs> let me, wow. and, and like drive around till I find a four block away of parking, you know? Yeah. Like I'm, I, I believe now if you don't break a small rule, you won't break a big rule. Okay. So that's my motto and I yeah. live by that. Yeah. I don't okay. break a small rule. Cause then I might let my guard down. Oh, I got away with that. Let me get it, you know. Yeah, no, sure, I'm never sure. going back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Through the grace of God and um, the program and, you know, so, but anyway, so, um, yes, have I experienced a lot of trauma? Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think I had to kind of rewire my brain. And I believe when I paroled the safe haven, a safe haven, I, I didn't. Which is how we met. Which is how I, we I met. Was yeah. At yeah. A, a safe haven. And, and Lynn event. Orman Weiss, big shout out to shout her. Shout out to Lynn Orman. Shout <laughs> yeah. out to Nelly Vasquez. Nelly Vasquez, my hero, you know? And um, so it, I, I, I just started volunteering, and I was pretty much newly there. And um, I so wanted to be normal, whatever that means, uh-huh. you know? Yeah. And um, I kind of made my mind up, or at least said, I'll try. I never tried my whole life. Let's just give it a try. Yeah. And um, I started volunteering, and all of a sudden, after about a couple months, somebody walked up, and Nellie introduced me, and I noticed they looked at me with some respect. and Because they didn't know whether I worked there or not. Because yeah. now I'm kind of you know, looking okay, healthy. I've been already in prison some years, you know? Yeah. And so I, but I did notice that this person is looking at you with some, with respect. Yeah. And I liked that. And I was just like baffled by it. Like, wow, nobody's ever looked at me with any kind of respect, you know? Uh-huh. Self, it, and it gave me more motivation because I was like, I kind of like that. And then Nellie um, told her people, Bianca always wants to volunteer. And I did work nights. I had my job, violence prevention. And uh, I got back to the program. 
probably by like one, one, two in the morning. And then Nellie said, ask her if she wants to answer, volunteer at the front desk and answer the phones at 5 a.m. Mm. Not a lot of people are calling a safe haven from 5 to 7 a.m. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I was so excited that I felt like really important, you know? Yeah. And I'd just be staring at the phone, <laughs> like, please ring so I can, you know, because Nellie told her staff, she has a, she's, um, you know, she's got a, a good voice and she's um, polite and she'll be fine answering. Okay. So the rare time the phone would ring, you know, I'd get all excited, yeah. you know, you know, a safe haven, a safe haven foundation. This is Bianca. How can I help you? And I was like, oh my God, I'm like a big deal. You know, I thought with that awesome. little phone call. So all these things, and I often joke with Nellie, they tricked me. And so um, they tricked you to do what? Or, or to do better, but yeah. I didn't know they were tricking me. <laughs> so, like I, so by like giving. Okay, here's an example how they tricked me. So remember, I had a whole life of some reckless, uh, high risk criminal and high risk street activity. Yeah, drug, drugs, gangs. And... I had no rules. I did what uh-huh. I wanted. I slept. Stayed yeah. up four days, slept as long as I wanted, maybe crawled in a cubbyhole of an yeah. abandoned building. Um, just for the record, I never actually slept on the street. But, um, but well, with the thing with Vic Mensa, but oh, yeah, we'll you, get to that. But anyway, yeah. so... Well, we'll touch on that real quick. You you stayed outside in the street in, with Vic Mensa. In 20... As a uh, the homeless? Winter. Were you guys with the homeless? No. So... Um, Vic Mensa organized. He calls me Auntie Bianca. I'm very close with his whole family. And oh, okay. I call him my nephew. So we're like, okay. it's not that I'm just cool with him. We're yeah, like family. You're like family. Like cool. his fans, because I'm always on a story. Yeah. Are in, you know, stuff or with him. And um, not so much lately because he's really busy doing other international stuff. But but anyway, his. I'll be at a, at a festival or a concert and young girls will walk up to me and go, oh, my God, are you Auntie Bianca? Oh, yeah. And I'll be like, are you talking about Vic? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Auntie Bianca. And they're like, oh, God, can we get a selfie with you? <laughs> and, like, his fans reach out to me. And I'm like, Vic, I, I, like, stop. Like, what, what, like, I'm getting bombarded by your fans. I'm like, I don't care, though. I'm nice, <laughs> you cool. know. And um, when I've gone out of state to festivals... And I'm walking through the back, and you got like TMZ and all these paparazzi mm-hmm. and lights in the face. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, wow, this is what, how you live, you know? But anyway, it's pretty cool. I like it, yeah, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so he organized with some other, you know, in his crew. Yeah. But it was during the pandemic. So we had to wear masks. And, but it was a small group of us, maybe seven. And um, he promoted it. And we were going to sleep outside on the street in December of 2020 um, for 12 hours, from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. in the morning. Okay. And all the money, and he was live on his Instagram the whole time. We did a small march with some other people. Then from there, we everyone dispersed. And then the six, seven of us went to our little street against a building Um on 47th, and I think Vincent, how do you say it? Vincentes? Vin, I don't know. Uh, a sure. South Side, you know, in Bronzeville. Bronzeville. Okay. Yeah, so, or next e- to east, it. East of uh, back of the yards. Yeah, so, um, yeah, anyway, it was on 47th. So, and there's all these news cameras, plus he's um, live on Instagram. And, you know, we're freezing on layers and layers. We got our masks on, and like, I had my earmuffs on and I've seen some pictures. It yeah. Looked, it well, it was all rough. over. It was on TMZ. It was yeah. on Hollywood something, you know, um, it was like everywhere. People were saying, Oh, taking pictures of like, you, you, I just saw you on TV. And I'm like, well, this is for the kids, you know? So it was, it was, okay. to, it was to raise money for homeless youth, okay. primarily of color, black, primarily black that have slipped through the cracks of DCFS yeah. Oh, and, damn. and DCFS needs to be like a whole, you know, re, re, whatever they call it, 
re- reinvented or something oh, okay. like they're, they they I, I understand their uh, their social workers are extremely overwhelmed big oh, okay. caseloads but something needs to be done because after you are in the system and you go to so many group homes at some point at 16 if you don't come back to the group home no they might say he, he or she never came back but nobody really looks for you or does anything yeah. you've slipped through the crack now now yeah. you're homeless you know now yeah. you may make bad, worse um, decisions, you know? I mean, if you were in DCFS because of something of your family, it's really not your fault, you right. know? But anyway, so um, so we're sitting there all night. And in the beginning, we're all talking, and it's like, you know, and Vic did a little interview with the news, and we're all, you know, just sitting there. And, and all we had, like a, like a blanket or a-, a Sleeping bag Sleeping, or not all of us, but a sleeping bag we kind of would share. So you're camping in the city. Yeah, I don't know Without about camping. A tent. Yeah, but we didn't all. Excuse me, we did not all have sleeping bags. It was yeah. like, okay, you've had it for two hours. I get. Put, You're getting give it cold. Up. You're getting cold. Yeah, give it there. up now. And we had blankets, but and homeless people have that Damn. as well, you yeah. know. So anyway, so one of the guys said, "Well, Bianca, you must be used to this. Anyway, it's not no big deal for you." And I go, "Hold on, hold on. Let's oh, get this shit. straight right now." This is the first time in my entire life that I've literally sat or slept, which I'm, we didn't really sleep, maybe dozed off for a minute, that I've actually been on the street sitting with nowhere to go all night long, freezing. Yeah. I have never done this. I always found an apartment or somebody I could pay drugs with to sleep on their couch or yeah, an abandoned yeah. building. I but found some Not on the sidewalk. I never slept on the sidewalk yeah. or under a bridge or yeah. did any of that. But anyhow, I'm but not you, trying to... Did you stay in like a, an abandoned... Uh, and abandoned building, buildings, but you're yeah. Still in a building. Yeah, and usually, like in the projects or buildings that That's are abandoned, crazy, they the people who own them or the city they don't turn the heat off because then the pipes are going to burst. Oh, so oh. they're heated. There might not be electricity, Interesting. but they're, they're heated. But you're sleeping with rats as well, you know. I right, mean, which right. is horrifying to me. But anyhow, so yeah. But to anybody, it, it was the life, you know. What could I say? And um, but anyway. And, and I don't mean to say that like I'm better than some people because I didn't sleep under a viaduct because that if I hadn't changed my life around, that could have been my next yeah, move. You know, yeah. we don't know. So I am no, I'm not better than anyone. I never portray myself as I'm better than big me, little you. I'm the same as everybody, yeah, you know. Yeah. But anyway, um, so at some, it was kind of funny. We, Vic ended up, or all of us, because he has a foundation, Save Money, Save Life Foundation. Okay. And he, we were able to raise over $16,000. Awesome. And all that went to homeless youth. Wow. With, with rather, you know, getting them into like Covenant House or yeah. buying them clothes or sleeping bags or a tent or what, whatever. The money was, every penny was used for homeless youth. So under the age of 18. And so... Um, but anyway, at like by two in the morning, you know, we're out there all these hours and we're free. You know, my hair's long and it's like wind and yeah. every two seconds a police car is flying by and gunshots and, oh you know, and it was just this crazy, you know. And so, but after we're talking and talking, it was like all of a sudden like everyone's quiet because we're getting delirious now. And now we realize we're freezing and we got to stay out here till the morning, oh you know. God, yeah. So at one point, I Vic has this song. It's called Reverse, uh-huh. with G Money featuring G Money. Okay. And at the end, it says, um, "Wait, how does I don't anyway anyway something about like your hands are kind of dusty. Uh, don't touch. Oh wait, my don't touch my my uh, my." my uh my jacket or something like that your hands look kind of dusty and paris out the country you know or something like that uh-huh. and so um you know put it in reverse turn around throw it in reverse you know yep, yep. so anyway that song right yeah, yeah so um it's all quiet everyone's quiet but we're all awake but kind of like delirious i got leaves in my hair and everything we all do right so um quiet all of a sudden i go um uh pull that back like Michael Jackson. I'm singing, you know? Uh-huh. And so then um, everyone started laughing, right? But so it was kind of like a funny moment, you know? Yeah. And I'm singing, I'm singing the little flow in from G Money uh-huh. and then also Vic, you know? 
Um, oh, and then G Money goes, "This is he's in a straitjacket on the stage. This is not a game or something, you know." Uh -huh. So at the time, I'm singing the lyrics, and then quiet again, and then I sing, "I got a lot of dirt on my name. My mama had a beef with the whole gang." And so then Vic goes, "Auntie." Those are not the lyrics. And I go, yes, they are. And he's like, my mama, she never had a problem with anybody. And I go, I want well, me, it's just lyrics. That those are the lyrics. And he's like, Bianca, Auntie Bianca, I wrote the song. Those are not the lyrics. And I'm like, you know, I had a lot of dirt on my name. My mama had a beef with the whole gang. And he said, no, it's I might have had a beef with the whole rap game. And so I'm like, oh, okay, or whatever, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but we were like having fun like that. And uh, one thing, because um, it was this big promoted thing and a lot of news coverage on it, so all these restaurants were pulling up at spread, at, you know, times, not all at once. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like um, Thai food, you know, and bringing these big pans of uh, this great food, French restaurants, um, Shrimp for, for, for who? Though? For us. Oh, like going yeah. like, oh, you guys must be hungry, you know? And so, and shrimp cocktail and Puerto Rican food and the bananas and the Mexican food and rice and yeah. like all this, like, like um, uh, sweet and sour chicken, you know? And we were starving, you know? Yeah. But, and at one point it was like, oh God, we got to eat something. And we were like, no, look at all those TV cameras. How are we going to look? We're homeless, trying to raise money. But let, let, let's sit here and eat, eat sweet and sour chicken and shrimp dijon and yeah. shrimp cocktail. Oh so God. we didn't. And, um, and then um, we, we noticed that like a block down was a viaduct. And there were a lot of teenage homeless people homeless, under there. Yeah. So at one point we brought all the food to them. Oh, great. So that was a good gesture. You know, that was the right thing to do, yeah, you know. Yeah. And they were so happy. And and it came with like paper plates and forks and nap, nap uh, napkins and you know, even pop and water. Amazing. Yeah, and there was like seven of us and we were just all carried it down there. So they were very happy. And then actually when we went down there, we saw Vic did have in his foundation that he got as donations like brand new sleeping bags and then uh Vic Mensa did um and Landi um I forget her last name um oh, she's a native Indian um Keepsy Keepsy I don't want to sorry Landi I don't want to say your name wrong <laughs> but she's the um president of his foundation oh okay yeah save money save life foundation but awesome. anyway so we all and she was there that night too and we were just oh my god anyway so um they we brought also some sleeping bags for them. Oh, okay, great. great. <laughs> and then also, now the all the now it's getting close to six a.m. We said from six p.m. to six a.m. Yeah. Now you could imagine how we all looked for twelve hours, freezing with the wind blowing and leaves in our hair and starving, you know. And so, as soon as it, it was like six. The whole, all of 47 filled up with all these news cameras, like all, every oh, news, yeah. like ABC, NBC, uh, WGN, and independent ones. And the, um, what do they call, which is the one from the Hispanic station? Univision. Yeah. So everybody <laughs> was there, right? And wow. so now they want an interview of like, because it was transparent where you could like look on the link mm -hmm. and see what we raised. So they already knew oh, okay. that we raised over 16,000. So they wanted a statement. And we did actually have a big check that we had this planned out so that whatever the amount was at that 6 a.m., yeah. we would write it in. And so we would make some, you know, to show we raised cool. this much money for children, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but the way we all looked, the, <laughs> as soon as they started pulling up, I go, okay, nephew, I'm out of here. I, you do what you got to do. And I'm like this with, with my I, with my hoodie and my mask. And I, I'm trying to like this. You know, I don't want anybody to see me. Like, no, yeah. I can't be on TV looking like this. Oh my God. So the earlier ones with me just sitting up against the wall with the earmuffs on. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, um, but as I found out, we all did that. We all got little on the news because we all looked horrible. 
Like that, it was like crazy. We're, first of all, we're shaking, freezing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I couldn't wait to get in my car to put the heat on, blasting, and put my hand. My oh hands my were. We had gloves, but yeah, yeah. you're cold. Right, right. So um, we all got little, and I guess Vic, his representative, said, "Look, Vic will come back here in three hours and make a, you know, give you an interview, you know." And so then they did it. I didn't even come. I was like, okay, I did my um, yeah. my charity work. You know, I was yeah. already home in bed. I was like, I'm not. I was so cold. Yeah. But yeah, it was for a good cause. I, I'm up for anything for a good. No, cause. you're doing a lot of amazing things, and I like Thank watching you. you in action. And-, and and to your question about like how do I deal with cope with like past trauma? Yeah. yeah. So I truly believe that the work that I do, okay, yes, it's helping others. But by helping others is actually helping me okay. somehow. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. Yeah, and it, and it empowers me. Now, I've had people say, okay, out of 25 high-risk individuals in street um, activity, out of tw- 25, how many do you save? And I'll say, mm, two, three tops out of 25. Maybe two, maybe one. Why do you even bother? You know, I'm not just sensitive like that. I'm like, I bother because if it's just one, that's a life. That's a human being. So, and I know I've saved a lot of young men and even got some on different paths who are doing great now wow. that I don't hear from for years. And I wonder, I don't know if they're dead or if they're in a prison in another state because I'll look them up in Illinois. But um, I start to look, I sort of think, I think about them often. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, I'll get, I got like one messenger from an individual that moved out of state. Oh my God, he was so high risk. He like literally on both sides being shot, shooting, you know, I don't know if he's ever, you know, killed or shot anybody, but he was out there like that, right? Young guy. And I, I wouldn't give up on him. And, um, years went by, I hadn't heard from him and he sent me an inbox on Messenger, and he said, you know, Bianca, I was just sitting here, and I started really thinking, and I thought, you know what? I would not be where I am today without you. So that gives me the strength to go after the next person, you know? Another young, well, he's probably in his 20s now, but I knew him since high school. I kind of like to go for the worst of the worst somehow. That's my preference. Uh Like, I'll help anybody, and I actually do concentrate more on younger people to prevent them proactively from going down that path. But, um, yeah, so um, this one kid, I don't know, well, he was probably 17, 18, and he kind of, you know, he had been through some stuff already, and I somehow he wanted a job. I did get him a job in a jewel as a bagger, in spite of his felon. Convi- he had like a nonviolent felony conviction. Okay. They they hired him based on my recommend. Like I co-signed yeah. it, right? Yeah. So they hired him. They never heard from him again, and I didn't know. Nobody knew where he was. You know, he wasn't in the in the uh, the corners he once would hang at. So I had often thought about him for years. Then one day I got a message, a messenger, and it said, "Bianca, this is so and so, and you know, I just really want to thank you." Because I now live in a very far suburb, very nice suburb. And because that job you got me, I worked hard. This was in the city. Yeah. And I got promoted to another, it was a jewel. He was a bagger. He said, I kept getting promoted. And then now I'm um, a supervisor or a general manager of the store. And I met this girl here. And we had a child together. We have a beautiful apartment. Amazing. And I wow. just want to really thank you. But more so, can you come have dinner with us? Because I want you to meet the family that I would never have had it not been wow. for you mentoring me. Yeah. So I'm not trying to take credit. And at that time when someone says that to me, I discourage them in a way. Like, no, I gave you an option. <laughs> yeah. You, you took, did it. You did this. Yeah. I didn't do anything. All I did is believe in you long enough until you could believe in yourself the same way someone did for me. And um, I gave you a path. You didn't have to take that job, but you did. 
you did this, you worked hard, you yeah. got promoted, you met a girl, you're the good father, you know? Yeah. So you did this, never forget that. And I'm yeah. glad I could play some small role in your life. And I love you. And yes, I'll come for dinner. And wow. I did go and met his the whole little family. That you know? is amazing. Yeah, it, really, it brings me to tears, you know? Yeah. So when people, the naysayers of like, yeah, I can't stop everything. And there's a whole lot of people. There are a lot of anti-violence act activists, violence interrupters in the Chicagoland area all over. We can only do so much, you know yeah, what I mean? Right. Even if I could stop you from pulling the trigger today, mm -hmm. and I'll hang with you all night once I talk you into putting the gun down, you're not getting rid of me. Because I'm, I'm like, no, if I leave, your guys might whisper in your ear, and then you're back on it. Yeah, you're yeah. stuck with me. So tell your girlfriend, ain't no action tonight, because you're stuck with me. <laughs> and so they kind of laugh. and I, But that doesn't mean that tomorrow it won't happen. Yeah, right. So you just keep doing the best you can. And sure. I do concentrate on a lot of, you know, like younger kids. I speak at a lot of even like seventh, eighth graders, okay. high school. And, um, you know, hope that I can reach somebody or, you know, like even with my book, my book authors that people think because you have a book like you're rich. Authors actually don't get rich unless you're Stephen King or, you know, uh, Patterson, you know, Michelle Obama. I mean, like mm -hmm. some big, huge name, you know, or some yeah. dirt, you know, you got some dirt on somebody, then you get rich, you, you become a bestseller or a big rock star, right? I'm just a regular girl with a story. And the story ends extremely. The last couple chapters, most readers say they, they're crying. They're literally crying, you know? So... And Bianca's book is called In Deep, which I did read a little bit of it. I didn't finish it. But you just hooked me up with this sticker. What is it? So in 2019, this book won... Uh, 2019 Book of the Year, of award, the year award, award. award. It's an awesome. award-winning book. It's not a bestseller. And where is this available? I know I saw it on Amazon. So it's available on Amazon. It's available in a hard copy format, Kindle, actual um, CDs for audio, and it's also available on audio on Audible. I mean, on audio CDs and then Audible. Right, Audible. I saw it on there too. Yeah, and so I tell people if you, whoever, I have a website, it's just my name. So, um, my name.com. So, in the event, because I, 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 you know, I, I found out that a doctor at the university said to me, oh my God, I listened to your book on Audible. I was so, and especially, like everything you've been through and knowing you now, like yeah. I would assume you'd be brain dead, but like you're, you're doing analytic, analytic, analytic. Oh my God. My analytic. Yeah. Vi, um, data. Yeah. Sorry I, about okay. that, everybody. I, I actually am smart. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah. And, um, like really high level stuff that yeah. I learned. I did go back to college. I took college classes in prison but then I earned my bachelor degree in inner city studies. I'm currently about to uh, go for my master's in social work. Oh, wow, cool. And I'm Very old. Cool. I'm I'm gonna be 65. You're though I, rocking. Though that's I think I'm you, 35. That's what you're doing. Yeah, but um, so I'm not gonna be get a new. I, it's not about like oh I got all these degrees. I'm gonna get a new job. No, no. <laughs> Here's the thing. For me, it's for me to show myself that I could start something and finish something. Yeah. That's simply it. Yeah. And, and and then maybe my great-great-grandchildren will somehow find out about my story and be like, wow, our great-great-grandmother, they're all through this. And then she got an associate, a bachelor, and a master's <laughs> so in social cool. work. You know, So it's kind of like everything I do, there's a bigger picture of yeah. some kind of inspiration to someone even in the future or a current... But um, if you get the Audible, go on my website. You could contact me through my website and say, you know, hi, I got the um, Audible. Because you're not going to get the very cool pictures. You could open it to the pictures. Oh, yeah. You won't get the very cool pictures that go with the stories. Um, that's my now life, you know. But anyway, so it starts out kind of crazy. But anyway, so, but they go with the stories and... 
like I said, I'm not a likable character, but I am no longer that person. And if you stick with the book and read till the end, you will be inspired um, by the climb out of hell and or not, you know, but most people are. So the thing is that um, email me through my website and I will email you back the official photo file with the captions from that you see here. That's awesome. the official photo file from the publisher. It's published by Chicago Review Press. It is not a self-published book. Um, so, yeah. Cool. There you have it. Yeah. Well, Bianca, thanks so much for you know coming on the show and sharing your story and expressing how you deal with, with some of the trauma, which I got you doing good in someone else's life. Yeah. Helps. You know, and a lot of times, you know, I'll lay, I'll be watching the TV and, and it'll come in my mind some of the things I did in the past, you know? Yeah. And it'll hit my head like, wow, you pickpocketed that man. That might have been his rent. That might have <laughs> yeah. been his only food for his family, you yeah, know? Yeah, you're so I'm feeling I, guilty I, about it. Well, I can't change the past. So mm -hmm. I try, I just continue over 13 years now doing. Every day trying to be the best person I can. I want to learn. I want to soak up any knowledge that anyone has. I want it. And um, so when I think back at that, I'm not proud of those stories. Yeah. So some people, there's a couple of bad reviews, but like they're like, oh, she's glorifying. No, mm. I'm really not. I'm just telling you exactly how it is in the mind frame that I had in 1977. Yeah. Yeah. I can't apologize after every um, chapter. And oh, and by the way, I hate that I did this. You know, no, I'm telling you how I used to think, holding your hand through this horrific lifestyle that anyone would bring on to themselves. And then I'm holding your hand as I climb out of hell and make a life for myself, you know, yeah. reunite with my children. Um, they have. They, some of it, it took some years. Everybody recovers in their own time. Sure. And I'm a really good grandma because they were all little, so they don't know anything. My, <laughs> I have to give a big shout out to my granddaughter Gemma. Um, she calls me gangs, gangs the grandma, you know, because <laughs> she saw me. She sees me with rappers, you know. Yeah. And she's always like, she, and her and her, all, she's like, grandma, all my friends follow you on Instagram and I'm and TikTok. And I'm like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> That's so cool, though. yeah, it's cool. So. But uh, we're, she's a good girl, you know. But yeah, she just thinks I'm hilarious. And I also have this um, unique talent. If I'm with a five year old, I actually can put my mind frame on the five year old level. Okay. So kids love me, you know, like I'll get on the floor and play with them and laugh and, you know, or a 10 year old or a 15 year old. Yeah. And my granddaughter, she just turned 13. And um, yeah, it's, it's, she's a lot of fun. But I love all my grandchildren, you know. Awesome. awesome. And uh, and I babysit a lot for my daughter Ashley, and and uh, I hang with my daughter Aaliyah. That's my last child, which I'm so grateful to God that I have a relationship with them. Yeah. Like that, yeah. and it's a lot of fun. And I'm proud of both of them. My daughter Aaliyah just got her her master's in social work from Dominican University. Oh, and okay. um, now she works as a therapist for an actual, you know, place, a private company. Oh, okay. And um, she's happy doing that. And my son, Anthony, who goes by Tony, is a professional violinist. You've probably seen him on awesome. my page. But he's he, he he's, can play anything, you know. He toured with the... Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Oh, he was okay. the youngest member for four years and toured around the world, even it's a big China. Deal. Yeah. So the maestro says he's a prodigy. He's amazing. I'm not trying to brag on my kids to your audience. Hey, but, brag all you but want. <laughs> no, I'm just grateful that I even know them, you know, because a lot of mothers yeah, yeah. with my past life, they never see their children again. I was lucky yeah. that family and, you know, I was able to. My daughter, Ashley is married to a police officer who I absolutely adore, who actually told her in, when, in the future, I'd rather have your mother live with us than my mother. And her, his mother's amazing, I love her. And my daughter says, oh my God, I'd rather have your mother than my mother. So it's always this fun joke. But um, she's a realtor 
She has, um, they have children together. They're blend co-parenting, you know, like he yeah. had two kids. She had a daughter, my granddaughter, Natalie. And then together they had a, ch- a little boy. Okay. And, and I babysit all the time without any hesitation. And um, I'm just happy to be able to do things with them. So the grandson is like four. But I become four. Uh-huh. He loves me. We have we laugh. We have fun. I play with his goofball toys, you know. Yeah. But she's got huge like Labradors, big dogs, you know. Uh-huh. And my and my daughter told her husband, those dogs are harder to take care of. They almost knock you over when it's feeding time or let them out the out the backyard. And um, my daughter told her husband, you know, I figured it out. If if my mom can handle. These dogs without relapsing on heroin, she's good for life. Because <laughs> it would make anybody else go get a bottle of alcohol and drink. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, I'm out of there. Crazy dogs. Yeah. Oh, they're. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm. I. They're. They're. I love the dogs. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Dogs are amazing. Yeah, but they are a lot. A handful more than the child. You know. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So life is good. I mean, I have problems just like anybody else. Ups and downs. Every human person on the planet deals with different things month by month, you yeah, know? Yeah. Uh, but now I have a clear how to deal with them. So sometimes I'm like, oh my God, now what? You know, but I get through it. Yeah. And I'm not high. I don't drink. I don't smoke pot. I don't do anything. And I could still go to a concert or a club with mu- live music where I guarantee you. There's somebody in that club that's look pointing at me, going, "Boy, that broad is really loaded," mm. and I'm literally the only sober person in the club or bar or yeah. a concert, you know, because yeah. I can have a lot of fun. I'm like myself, you know, yeah. so it's a one, it's a wonderful thing. No, it's great to see that, you know, we're capable of changing and becoming better, and it's really on us to yeah, do that. Yeah, absolutely. But someone believing in you helps. And that's, yeah, that's and a whole lot of people mentioned. have believed in me and helped me along the way. And I want to give a shout out to a colleague and a friend, Sheila Regan, um, for over like for year years ago and even till today, continues. She's extremely intelligent and smart, and she continued in the in the beginning. I didn't even know how to turn a computer on. I oh, did not okay. even know what Excel was. Now I'm like a whiz, you know? Nice. Like I, I, Microsoft Office, my eyes closed, you know? But I learned a, like probably 95% of that from Sheila. And cool. so, and I want to give another um, shout out to LaVon Stone Sr., who okay. is a, a CEO. He's a CEO at his own not for profit, Aclivis Inc., um, Chicago. But the reason is LaVon. I've known him for a long time since since I got my first job, and um, he's a colleague. He is the the most inspirational man I've ever met in my life, you know. Okay. And um, he has his own little way of inspiring you, or you know, like with yeah, me yeah. anyway, giving me advice early on. If I'd lose an individual on the street, you know, they get killed. Yeah, I'd almost fall apart like in 2014 15 and at the office they would know this big profile homicide that oh bianca was really close with this kid and um she's going to be torn up and i remember the most one of, of von gives me a lot of good advice and so does sheila and i'm grateful to them and um but von said to me he knew that i was going to come into the office like gone you know yeah so i get off the elevator and you could see like i'm choking up tears and von's kind of like almost like waiting but i don't know if he was or not but he happened to be kind of like in the hall near my office and um i walked by and he was like bianca are you all right you know like they all knew and i said um an up-and-coming rapper that was killed whose name i don't want to say because i wouldn't want anyone to think i'm trying to get get cloud off the back of somebody that's not who i am but um I was devastated. It was hard for me to accept. And Vaughn said to me, Bianca, I started kind of crying, like ch- choking up. And then um, he said to me, Bianca, what could you have done to save his life? And I started 
rattling off all these really unrealistic things. I, I don't know. I, I should have sent him out, out of the out of the state. I, I should have got him his own apartment. Maybe he could have lived with me. You know, like those. Come on. You know, yeah. like first of all, like how unethical is that to take a participant to live in your house? You know, but and and I don't. Have, I'm not rich. I can't afford to, to get him an apartment. And, and the bottom line is. He was not ready and wasn't changing his mindset. You have to want to change that. I no longer think the way I once thought, so I no longer behave the way I once behaved. But in this situation, I was rattling off these unrealistic, you know, solutions. Yeah. And Vaughn said, stop. And so I stopped and he said, I'm going to tell you something. Some people are destined to destroy themselves no matter what you do. And then he said, I'm going to say it one more time. And he did. And that really sunk in my head. I want to also mention on a professional level, when he first saw me and saw me crying, he offered, did you want me to get you some trauma counseling? Did you want to talk to somebody? Because I, we all know you're really, you truly really tried with this young man and you were close to him and his family and, you know, we have resources available here. Yeah. So do you want to talk to somebody? And I said, no, I'll be okay. I refused. And then he went into, and when he said that to me, slowly, I started, I still get upset. Don't get me wrong. I feel bad. But I think of that sentence he told me every time. And I understand it a lot better. This was like in 2015, he said that to me. Yeah. So now moving forward, I think about that and I just do the best I can. Doesn't mean I don't feel bad when I, when somebody gets killed, but there's I, only so much you can I, do. I understand now. You know, you did everything you did. Yeah, yeah. It's not your fault, you know, cuz earlier on I felt guilty like I should have did more, I should have yeah. did this, but no, it's not my fault. I did what I could, you know, and and I, I don't give up. Like I was still trying to work with this individual until he died, yeah. you know? Yeah. A week before I had got him a state ID, got him the paperwork so he can get yeah. a new state ID. So, I mean, I don't ever turn my back. Some point with some guys, I know the inevitable is they're gonna end up in prison for the rest of their life or killed. Or buried. And I hate that, you know, and yeah. I hate that I get that call, you know? Yeah, but yeah. yeah, so I'm just gonna keep doing, I know I, I, I'm, so my mission in life, I'm gonna save the world. And I actually know that I can't save the world, but I'm going to keep believing I You're can. You're aiming high. I'm going to believe that, that I can amazing, save the world yeah. until I die. And hopefully by the time I die, I have chipped off just a, enough to make a little dent. You know what I mean? So maybe somebody will carry well, on. Well, maybe that'll be the snowball effect. You know? <laughs> maybe, It'll just keep yeah, may, maybe I'll there. win the Nobel Peace Prize when I'm 90, right? That'd be awesome. For saving yeah. the world. Hey, you never know. <laughs> you never know. But I'm going to keep believing it. I know I can't, but I'm going to continue to try and uh, awesome. until I die. Well, you're an amazing person, Bianca. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for sharing everything and, you know, um, your experience. It, it teaches people a lot and hopefully our listeners, if someone's going through something, they get something. They'll definitely relate on whatever yeah. level. And also there's some, there's, uh, three stories in there and like beginning mid and then towards the end of a current situation of what I do now. So the reader, obviously that, you know, I made it out, you know, mm -hmm. but the reader keeps it in perspective that, okay, this was her. And it's like a, sh a very short chapters, three, like 10 pages yeah. kind of a, of what I do now. So that, so the reader gets that little okay. insight and then they go back into my past life. And then the end is, very inspirational. I mean, any anybody, I think, you know, I mean, most people sit, tell me, they're like, I, I cried the whole time in the end, you know, how hard I fought to try to get a life or get my life back and yeah. not not knowing if my son, Sean, that you met would ever yeah. talk to me again, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm just, I'm really grateful to God and I'm going to keep doing what I do. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do too. Uh you Thanks. know, I, I'm like kind of humble. Um, I, I look at it like it's, it's God has given me a purpose and a privilege. And I'm not the most holy religious person, but I am spiritual. 
Okay. And I do believe in God and Jesus. Obviously, I'm Italian. I was raised Catholic. So, oh, okay. but I'm I, I'm not like a practicing Catholic. Although my point is that I do believe that God has given me a purpose to move forward, and um, and I'm grateful for that. And I'm and it really helps me to help others. And I get to get up close and personal where a lot of people only read about this stuff or see it on the news. Yeah. And I kind of know more of the story. So I'm always trying to treat the root causes just like Nellie and A Safe Haven did for me. They treated the root causes. I see. I never look back. Yeah. Cool. So right, cool. there's a lot of stories in the book and horrifying. <laughs> Go check out the book and feel free to reach out to Bianca. For the something. Audible, and my website is just myname.com. Okay. Thanks again, Bianca. Thank you so much, Oliver. I really appreciate you having me.